Hello, this is Pastor Jay with Walker Truth Radio Podcast and Senior Pastor of Walker Truth Christian Fellowship Church. I want to invite all those in the St. Louis metropolitan area to come worship with us every Sunday at 8 a.m. at the Universal Church of Jesus Christ building located at 2301 Wallace Avenue. That's W-A-L-L-I-S Avenue 63114 in Overland, Missouri. Our Dig Deeper Bible Studies are held 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Tuesdays. Our Rescue Addiction Recovery class is being held at 7 p.m. on Mondays. We want you to come enjoy the love of God, worship with us, and go line by line and verse by verse as we travel through the Bible. We look forward to seeing you, and one of the things you can leave at home is your wallet. We want you to come sit back, enjoy the fellowship, the love, and the great teaching that goes on at Walk and Truth. This is Pastor Jay. I always want you to be encouraged to be blessed. And thank you for considering us as your place of worship. Peace. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And I want to quick, this is a quick overview. Romans chapter 2, 3, and 4 are about justification by faith. 5, 6, 7, and 8 is about sanctification, okay? Sanctification is what happens after you get saved, okay? So the bottom line is a couple of verses that we're going to read. Go to uh, Romans 3 and 28. Read that. 3 and 28. Again, I encourage you to pick out key verses up to this point to, that help you understand that we're saved by grace and not of works. Go ahead. And Abraham was the example given. Go ahead. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So we know or we behold, we, we have understood that we are justified, made righteous before God by faith apart from the law. So it's by faith through grace that we are saved, which is not of your own. That's Ephesians. It's a gift of God. So this gift of faith, this gift of grace, this gift of salvation is separate from the law. What was the purpose of the law? <coughs> if we're saved by faith apart from the law, what did the law, what could the law only do? Show us that we need a savior. Show us that we need a savior and show us that we are unable to keep them. You said it. Say it out loud. Sinful. That we're sinful. The law pointed to the fact, that, remember I always tell you, the law is there because you won't abide by it. Because if you abided by the law, there would be no reason for it, right? right. If, you, if, if you would conduct yourself in a, in a <laughs> right manner, there would not be need any stop signs. You would come to the stop sign. You would look left to the right. You would know that this person was there before you and you let them go, right? right. But you, knew, you know, if we took away all the stop signs, It'd be all kind of accidents. If we took away the speed limit, people would be going 100 miles an hour in the school zone. Stuff that you should know. See, this is the key with Romans. Romans say, if you do the things of the law that are in your heart and you don't have the law to show it to you, you have a law unto yourself. When you do stuff that is good and godly, you don't need a law to tell you to do or not to do. And that's where grace comes in. There are two different people. There are people who are scared of the fact that when you preach grace, there's not this law to tell you what to do. Okay? And then, because they believe in what we read earlier, what we're about to read, that when you preach grace, then you're preaching, you could sin if you want, because we read that where, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Okay? But, but the key is, you don't take advantage of grace in that way. Only an unregenerated sinner takes advantage of grace, which they do now. People who are not saved, as we learned in Romans 1, worship the creation more than the creator. They're taking advantage of every breath that God gives them to repent, and they're doing what they want to do. So they do, they'll take advantage of grace. But there's people in the Christian camp that says, look, we got to preach law because if we didn't preach law, that's saying you can do what you want to do. No, that's not saying you can do what you want to do. What we're saying is, if you are truly saved and regenerated and a new creature in Christ, living under the law of grace and love, you're not going to want to do the stuff that you used to do. Right, right. 
Your desire has changed. You are operating under a different law, a law of love. Meaning, I love Jesus and what he does for me so much that I don't need this external law saying, thou don't do. You should know not to cheat on your husband because you know love God. You should know not to lie and steal because you love God. You don't need the law to tell you anything anymore. You know, you, you, you know I'm thinking about, I don't need the law to tell me not to do stuff. I know because I love God not to do it. The more I appreciate him on the cross and what he's done for me and justified me and made me right before God, I can do things because of my conscience. So grace doesn't allow us to sin. What grace does is give us a better reason to do good. Okay? So we're saved apart from the law. We don't need the law. The law only condemns. The law only shows my shortcomings. The law only points out the fact that I can't. Grace says, I know you can't. I did so you could, wouldn't have to. And all you have to do is rest in what I did on the cross. Grace, the definition of the unmerited favor of God. You didn't earn it. He gave it. You didn't have to earn it. Law says you got to do these things to earn. There was law between the Jew and God. And guess, they read the Old Testament closely. They never got it right. And the minute they got it right, they went right back to doing something that was wrong. Okay? So we have to understand, we want to live under grace. And those who live under grace and who are saved, they do act different. They are new creatures. They do have a new conversation. They do have a new speech. They don't look at things like the world. They don't need the law to tell them anything. If you need the law to keep telling you not to commit adultery, then you ain't saved. I mean, it's just, it's just that simple. You haven't been regenerated yet. You come to church all you want. And, you know, like I said, y'all don't get the crazy stuff I get. If I saw, sent y'all half the stuff I get that's going on in these churches, y'all would think, church, I mean, churches are out of control. These pastors are just doing crazy stuff. These gay pastors are marrying these, these women and not telling them that they're gay. And this, this, this undercover brother thing is going on still. And these women are finding out that their husband is a year into their marriage. Their husband is gay. And sleeping with the digging. You know, I ain't talking about with the little, I'm talking about this is a grown man having affairs inside the church. And guess who's defending these men all the time because they pass us? Who's defending them? Women. The women. And you're going against your sister as if she did something wrong. You're, you're demonizing a woman who is married to a man who did tell the truth and then she's the she's Jezebel. Because I love my pastor. You're going to love him right on in the head. Because that's no way to do anybody. See, I don't need the law to tell me that's wrong. You know? And I'm talking about, you're not talking about mother one email. I'm talking about I get 10, 15 a day. All over the country, all over the world. These, these pastors out of control. And of course they happen to look like me. Majority of them, I, you know, and I understand why I get. It. I'm not saying the others are not doing it because they are, but I'm just saying it's just all of them look like the like cousin cousin Joe down the street, you know. And I'm like, wow, and they be having these, you know, they don't have a small congregation like us. They have large congregations, you know. They have a lot going on, but we shall not continue in sin that grace may abound, as some says. Do Paul is arguing the point? There was a group of libertarians that said. What Paul is saying is you can continue to sin and because you continue to sin, God's grace is going to be manifested even the more. But, but, but see, grace doesn't give us a license to sin. Grace gives us the ability not to. The law gives us an inability to, to fulfill it. Grace says, I fulfilled it. Just grow. Sanctification. So now we're going to talk about what do you do once you say how do you live? And this is where the scripture comes in. Be ye holy. Sanctification is about conforming to holiness. And holiness is not how you dress. Okay? Holiness is still the circumcision of the heart and being conformed into the image of Christ. So, all right, let's start in Romans 6 and 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Stop. So, the question is, what shall we say? Shall we continue to live in sin that grace may be manifested above sin? 
Because based upon the statement where sin is, grace abounds much more, the person will come argue back. Well, then you're saying we can continue to sin so grace can grow, okay? But that's not how we look at that. You don't look at the fact that God covers a multitude of sins as your license to sin so he can manifest his grace. You're, 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 you're going back to Romans 2 and 3 where it says that we take advantage of, go back to Romans 2 and 3. Let's, let, let's read that. Because this plays into this. Romans 2 and 3. Start there. And then 2 and 4. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So, and, and ask is, do you continue to do this sin not knowing that God is, take, is being patient with you so you can repent. He's not being patient with you so you can continue to sin. Right. I'm laughing because we read this, but people continue to sin. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and yes, the answer is yes. We do take advantage of that. His kindness, his forbearance. And we don't know that the goodness of God should lead us to repentance. We know that now that we saved, because we've repented. Right. But you spoke, you know, the Bible tells us to grow in grace mm -hmm. and we grow in faith. You should also grow in repentance. You grow in everything mm -hmm. that, can, that, that is good for God. Repentance is a great gift to grow in because with repentance, when you repent, that means that you know that you did wrong and you're going to ask God for forgiveness and that you want to change mind. Like I said, I, you know, I can go around here and pray for all of y'all and pray real loud and verbose and Jackie prays real well and, and all of that. But my point is, do we pray as well as we do for others as we do for ourselves? Or do we kind of be quiet? Mm -hmm. Oh, just forgive me, you know. I, you know, I want you to be as loud for the, yourself as you are for me. So God can deal with you. All right, let's go. Six chapter, verse two. By no means. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Mm -hmm. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Again, the answer is no. You got two questions. What's the first question? How can we, Go ahead. How can we who, di who died to sin still live in it? Easy. We ignore God. Go back to the sermon on Sunday. What? We don't we neglect such a great salvation. See, when you continue to live in sin, that means you practice it on a regular basis, wholesale sinner. <laughs> and you used to call yourself saved. You're neglecting what you claim that you are. You claim to be a new creature, but you haven't changed one iota. I mean, and again, we give room for slow change. But there should be some, some, some change in you once you get saved. You shouldn't be doing some things like, it's just things. You know, and I, and I hate to make a list of them because I know that I believe something out. But my, everybody, you know, something should like, okay, I ain't gonna, I'm not going to do that no more. Now, other things I have to work on, but that right there, I'm going to stop. You know, I'm going to stop. I'm going to God and shave me and I feel saved and I ran around the church, gave me right hand of fellowship and joined church and I'm a zealous for God. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to live with that kind of behavior for at least I'm going to let the Holy Spirit guide me in that. So yeah, we. how can we do it? We do it because we, we are sinful creatures still and sometimes we make false professions of faith based upon an emotional sermon that deals with our sin but we've not really been delivered from our sin. We just feel God has talked to us. And you know, it's kind of interesting to me. You talk about the God that said, let there be light. If God really talked to you like the people claim that he talked to you, you would probably really be different. Because everybody I know that ran into God in the Bible, when they met God, they were totally different, wasn't it? Wasn't no ifs, ands, and buts that they ran into God. When you, when you ran into them again, you could tell that they had some experience with something, and it's God, okay? All right, Jackie, can you pick up on verse 4? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Stop right there. Man, that is so great. Say, now, now think about this. Because, so if the, we got two questions about his, about sin and living in sin. And then, then it tells us our response. We were baptized, we was buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Meaning, 
You, when you come to Christ, you participate in his death. Okay? You participate not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. You get full benefit of him dying. And if you get full benefit of him dying, you get full benefit of the satisfaction of the wrath of God on your sin. Because remember, what actually took his life was the wrath of God. And once the wrath of God was finished, it was done. It was Death was paid for. So you were buried with him. Your sins should have been buried with him. Okay? When you get saved, that's one of the virtues, the benefits of being saved. What you were, sinner, has been buried with him. Okay? And the second part, read the second one after that. Yeah, being five. In order that, in or, order, go ahead. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. Okay. But I want to go back to five right quick. Okay. And it says, yeah, go back to five and start at, in, in order that. Oh, you mean chapter five? No, six verse four. I'm talking, I'm sorry. Four. Okay. Four, I'm sorry. Okay. My fault. Six okay. verse four. In order that. We were very. Go ahead. Okay. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, mm -hmm. in order that just as Christ was risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So we have a newness of, of life based upon the fact he is risen. That's how we have these songs about he is risen. They take significance because we have a newness of life in his resurrection. We are justified because he was raised. If Christ was still in the grave, we couldn't be justified. Because every man dies, right? Mm -hmm. But then he was raised on the third day, the Bible says, for our justification. He had to rise to give us justification. He has to be sitting on the right hand side of God, interceding on our behalf to be our high priest. A priest represents the people to God. A priest gives offerings to God. And the biggest offering that Jesus gave was what? His self, his life. So we're raised in this newness of life. You're a new creature. You don't have to do what you used to do. You don't have to let, let the external things of life govern your behavior anymore. More, more than that, your relationship with God is between you and God. You don't need an intermediator no more. Because the, the priest that you that's the intermediator for us, his name is Jesus. You don't need an angel. You don't need preachers. You don't need the preacher. Just need to preach the gospel. But you don't need to come to me to get to God. You can go directly to God yourself. Now, is there, there's nothing wrong with saints coming together and going to God. There's nothing wrong with that. But you shouldn't have the attitude. Well, if I don't give a mother ghost, then God ain't gonna listen to me. Well, you raise the newness just like she is. You're anointed with the Holy Spirit. Just like she is. And a lot of times in church, we preach these us, you know, have and have nots to the point where the people believe they can't do anything without the pastor or the leadership. And that's not good because leadership dies, don't they? And if you preach that and the people believe that, whether you're, you're purposely preaching it, but that's the flavor of your church, a lot of times when the leader dies, the church dies because so much is invested in where? In the leader. And it should be invested in God. Churches should continue forever if they're God's churches because everybody knows everybody dies. Right. Even, the, even Moses had to die. And what did Moses, see Joshua fell, Joshua kind of almost fell into it. What I'm going to do? What I'm going to do? What did Jesus, what did God say? Get up. You the next leader. Take him across. Nothing has changed about my promise because the leader died. I'm the leader of all the people. I'm the God of all these people. And these people got to cross over. He, he took them over the Red Sea. Joshua, you got to take them over the Jordan. Okay? Some of you are in that transition, whereas, you know, you're supposed to go to that next level, you know, but you can't use Moses' stuff to go across the Jordan. Moses was good to go across the Red Sea and get you through the wilderness. But it's like somebody else has to take you to the other side. So you, when you're raised in this newness of life, there are things that you need to leave behind from your old life that can't fit in your new life. There's things that I do that, that used to do 
that even not even necessarily was just her sinful sister jacket, but I can't fit into who I am today. You know, for instance, I was never a person who was a drunkard, but I used to like to go out and drink and have fun, just carouse with the guys. I mean, literally carouse with the guys. You know, nothing out of ordinary for men, but I just can't do that now like that. Not like that. You know, you know, cussing and fussing and half getting ready to fight. I can't do that no more. You know, oogly women. You know, I can't do that no more. You know, and, and, and my friends that are that are good guys, that are not saved, and they some of them are husbands, they still go out and do that kind of stuff. And I'm and again, I'm not judging them. I'm just saying I can't do it. Y'all go out and have a good time. You know, they'll go somewhere and drink 40, 50 cases of beer. I, I mean, I can't do that no more. Because it, it just doesn't fit who I am today. You know, and it has nothing to do with the pastor. It doesn't fit who I am as a Christian man. It just wouldn't fit. 90% of what I tell you is it has nothing to do with me being a pastor. It has something to do with a Christian man and appreciating what God has done for me. Because remember, God made me saved before he made me a pastor. Right. And that's what I harp on. I tell people all the time, you know, I, I ain't got to be recognized. Right. Recognize me as a man of God is Christ, man of God, not the pastor. Because mm. I almost don't want to be called pastor behind all this stuff I <laughs> All right. Uh, verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So in other words, the similarities, the parallelisms, the like, like meaning manner, not actual. So if you participate in his death, you participate in his burial, you participate in his resurrection, then you also get to participate in his life. The Bible says that we're joint heirs with him. Now, you're not going to be God but you're going to be like God, glorified body, all that stuff. So it says you got to go through this phase with God, which is part of your salvation. See, what, what, what he's telling you is these are the things that happens to you and happening to you ongoing when you're saved, which is called sanctification. So he's giving you the mechanisms. Now, do you feel that you're buried? No. Do you feel this stuff that I'm talking about? No. But you do have a better life that you should live that should be example. See, when I live a better life before people and people recognize the God that's in me, then I can tell them about the burial. I can tell them about the resurrection, even though I've never actually had it happen to me. But this is saying, if these things are true, then the result is a newness of life. That you participate, and it's all in him. It's not apart from him. It's not away from him. It's not around him. It's in him. The Bible tells us that our life is hid in him. Okay? In him. Go ahead. We know that our old self was crucified with him in mm -hmm. order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So, did you know that? Now, did you notice? We were, our old self was what with him? Crucified, right? With him. That what? Keep reading. Yeah. Read that again, Frida. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Stop right there. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Our old self, our flesh. Don't think of skin. Think of flesh as thought, deed, action, and mind. You need to close that door. Stop. 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 Come she, she might have lost her balance. Okay, so that's all right. No, better be saved. Her, we can wait. This can wait. Okay, so we know that that the old self was what crucified with him, in order that the purpose for it, that the body of sin, the sin that dwell with you, might be brought to nothing. Now, did you notice? It didn't say destroy, did it? No. It said bought to nothing, done away with, but it's not dead. Because it says, uh, now the next verse tells it, so that we would no longer be what? Enslaved. Enslaved to sin. So sin has no more control over you. It's not gone. Because he would have said it would have been put to death. What he's saying is it's been labeled ineffective in your life. 
The power is gone. It shouldn't affect you anymore like it used to. It shouldn't be so prevalent that when you see it, it attracts you. You said sin is not long, it's been labeled. It's ineffective. It doesn't have any power over you. You know, if, if, if it's not like the pretty woman ain't there. She's there. She ain't changed, she ain't changed that one measurement. Right, right. But if I'm under Christ, that which attracted me to her, which was her flesh and my flesh, mm -hmm. since I have labeled my flesh ineffective and it's been crucified with Christ, then whatever she looked like shouldn't have any power over me. She's still cute, she's still fine, but I'm not looking at her in a lustful way. I'm looking at her as a sister, potential sister in Christ. I'm not looking at her as, as, as mm, you know, that, that kind of, you don't even, ain't even got a word for it. Just, mm. Yeah, you don't, you don't even say, fine. You, say mm. you already know what the person thinks when they say that. Okay? You, you looking at her now like, hey, how you doing, sis? And she's wondering, she can feel the difference in you because you're not going, mm. You say, hey, sister, how you doing? And you shaking her hand from way back here. Now, this is the key with dealing with sin. If you know she got your number, why are you going to get up close to smell on her? <laughs> don't tempt yourself. I mean, for real. Yeah, don't tempt yourself. I tell people who are going through separation and all that stuff, when that person calls, don't answer the phone. Let them go to voicemail. Block their number until you get strong. Yeah. And when you get strong, then maybe, may, hey, maybe, maybe, right. yeah, right. maybe. Sometimes you need to leave a person when you when they dead to you. Let them stay dead. Yeah. You can't take them with you because you hook. What normally hook, hook, what happens when we hook up with lost love, which that's gonna be my message tomorrow. You really go backwards to the point that you even get worse involved. You dig a deeper hole because you're trying to make up for lost time. So instead of moving forward, you to move backwards. And then by the time you wake up from moving backwards, you didn't realize you've been stuck again. You caught up again. Now you caught up even worse because you didn't, you didn't went off on everybody that told you to move forward, and they they ain't fooling with you no more. You had nobody to turn to now that you didn't went back. Huh? My sister, my older sister, went through that. We moved her out. We gonna me and my brother, my dad. We gonna take care of her. You ain't gonna. And she married to that man right now. <laughs> Thirty years later. I mean, he's a good guy, but I mean, I'm saying we should have never got involved right. at that level. Yeah. You know, but we yeah. at the time, my dad learned a lesson that day. Said, "You ain't gonna never do this no more." Yeah. So when my little sister went through, we was like, "Bon voyage." <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She moved to Michigan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you marry? You know. Did you marry? She hey, she divorced from him. She married to another man now, but that guy that took her to Michigan wore her out. Yeah. Wore her out. And we stayed right here in St. Louis and sent her money. And my mama said, no, you can't come back here. Right. Mm -mm, not with him. Don't get involved. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Because you have been raised to a newness of life. You've been crucified with him. You've been raised with him. And you are a new creature. And again, sin should have no more power over you. Verse 7. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So this is still part of this sanctification. You know, this is not, these are facts, but these are something you have to mature into and believe. You don't necessarily believe this when you get saved. This is deep stuff here. This is not that old, you know, Oh, I'm going to say I'm saved and walk around and say it's taken by the Holy Ghost. This is real process of God and the one who is being sanctified's life. Yeah. You know, you come to these conclusions. That's why it says if, when. So this, when you say when, that means it can happen down the line. It don't happen the minute you get saved. See, sanctification, and we can kind of mix up between sanctification and salvation. Salvation is the one act of God on a sin sick soul that saves them from going to hell and 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 re and re uh, reconciles him back to God. Mm -hmm. Sanctification is the day after the process mm -hmm. of participating in the new life. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what we're reading now is that process. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
You, 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 you participate in the newness of life. And see, you can't experience that until you get down the road. You know, does every day, do I feel like I'm participating in the newness of life and I've been buried with him and raised to the... No. No, that's not realistic. What's reality is, I have to really concentrate on God to really appreciate and not neglect such a great salvation. It doesn't come natural. Now, is it a part of my daily life now? Of course it is. But it had to come from practice. You know, it wasn't one of them things where it's all of a sudden I... I got it all that, and that's what I keep trying to tell people. The, the point for, for the point for coming for us coming to Bible study is not necessarily so you can go around quoting scripture. Is that the scripture can be lived out through you, and that things things that we study will become true to you. And if they become true to you, then you can talk to other people about it. You know, and that's why we don't get caught up on the latest fad one way or the other when we know the truth of God. Every anybody and everybody can be saved. There's not a sin that God's blood. If, if the minute you create, there's somebody that you know that can't be saved because of what they do that you don't like. What you've done is just sit there and say, God, blood don't work. If it didn't work, and what you don't understand is if you said it didn't work for them, it didn't work for you. It didn't work for you. We have to say if a person decides to come to Christ and it's their last breath, he works. And we got to thank God for that. Remember the thief on the cross? What is, they didn't thief on the cross and get the chance to do any good on the natural earth, did he? Right. But he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Not by what he did, but what he believed. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I tell y'all, y'all seriously think about it. Some of the people you think going to be in heaven ain't going to be there. And some of the people you think they didn't make it, going to be sitting right there looking at you. You know what scripture says that too. You know. Exactly yeah. Says. So you got, you, 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 you got to understand that. Don't be so don't be so judgmental, so preferential to other people that's out that you think they live in such a bad life that God can't. You need to pray for them. Right. Just simply pray for them. And don't put no law on them. Throw grace. If, if, if we're sin abound, grace abounds much more. Your job is supposed to be dispense of grace. Now, grace does not make you a fool. I'm going to say it again. Grace is not meant to make you a fool. Some people, you just got to pray for them from a, from a distance. Some people you got to have you got to say, no, I can't handle you close to me. Let you just go over there and my prayers will touch God and God will deal with you. Because I can't deal with you no more. I have reached the end of my rope. Okay? And I got to move on. Because if I keep hanging around with you, I'm gonna fall. That's why the Bible tells us in Galatians 6 and 1, when we restore someone, be careful. Because while you're trying to restore them, if they're not trying to get restored, you'll fall back into what they're doing. When somebody telling you some sex, some sensual, sexual sin, they start going into details, places, positions, and all that, stop them. Stop them. You don't need to know all that. If you commit adultery and fornication, I don't need to know what, how you're doing it. Because what that happened, I'm still human. You, we need to pray for you and get you out of that situation. Okay? Because I understand my newness says sin shouldn't have no more power with me. But if I jump into the sin boat, what do you expect to happen? I got to roll with sin. 90% of the things that we can do, saints, we can avoid if we just stay away from them. The Bible says don't deal with fornication. Flee from it. Flee from it means you don't answer that phone call because that person got your number. You don't wait till you get to the house after you ate the meal and seen the movie. And then sitting there in the couch with it dark saying, I'm going to flee now. Too late now, you're in the trap. Too late now, you're in the trap now, okay? And that's what sin in general. Stay away from it if you can. Stay away, away from your friends that practice sin. And you know what they practice. Stay away from them. All right, go ahead. We almost done. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Mm -hmm. Death no longer has dominion over him. Okay, because Christ was raised from the dead, that thing called death has no more control over him. Dominion is control. Right. Oh, and because since we've been raised, death, uh, sin has no the dominion over him. Death has no control over us. Excuse me. That's why we do not fear dying. Because once we die in this flesh completely... Our death is consummated, then we are truly 
absent from the body, present with the Lord, never to die again. We are twice born, once died people. Okay? We are twice born, once died people. Now, people who ain't saved gonna be once born, twice die. They're gonna die at their natural death, and then there's complete separation from God on judgment day. On the, when they do the white throne judgment, where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, there's gonna be two lines. One gonna confess going to glory, the other's gonna confess and thrown in the outer darkness. Mm. Same confession, two different destinations. Okay? Because of what they decided to do over here. Okay? Mm. All right. Last verse. Go ahead. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So now, his death, remember we read in the other verses in Romans, that the one man's death brought about, one man's sin brought about the death penalty for everybody. And one man's obedience through the multitude of sin bought life for all those who would believe. So he died to sin. He died for sin. He died so that you wouldn't have to face what was due to you. The wages that you had earned, you deserve the death penalty. You were already condemned when you were born. You don't have to do anything. Okay? But you but you did some things and you earned some very good way. If you think about this, wherever you work there, just think about this. What if you earn what you earn working eight hours a day? Earn that same earner you used to get if you retired from your sin. You'd probably be a millionaire. <laughs> so, see, you're going to work eight hours a day to whatever hour related wage you got. But what if for every sinful thought you got paid the same hourly wage? Mm -hmm. You'd be rich. You'd be, you be rich. You'd be a, you might be a billionaire. Be <laughs> okay? Because the wages of sin is death. So the, the each sinful thought, that's a wage. So, so think about it. If you was making twenty dollars an hour, yeah. each simple thought you get twenty dollars. Oh, each simple thought twenty dollars. It just be raining money. It just be raining money. Hold on, hold on. We gonna go. It be like at the strip club. Be raining money down. On you. you know. So, and, and that's how powerful sin is in our life. And that's how you have to think of it. It rains its 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 wage down on you. And and people don't understand it until they get off in it. And next thing you know, something's doing something's happening in their life and they like but I didn't know that that was going to end me up over here right. mm -hmm. and even yeah. now you, I mean not, not intentionally but you'd be getting up and you have a good day so then to you think about nothing too and these crazy thoughts come all part of the mind I said I shake my head sometimes I shake my head even in church hmm. so I'd be like why am I thinking about that I ain't trying to think about that Lord yeah. I do have to say yeah that. and see yeah. these are being I'm honest right away yeah, it, I try to think about that. I mean, it don't even be something you even try to think about, right? It just come across your mind. It just come across. I mean, something on the outside when you try to focus in here. You could be driving, you could be sitting, you could be relaxing, you could be watching. I mean, it's anything, just any moment. Mm -hmm. And that's why God tell, it tells us keep our mind on Christ. Yeah. Think yeah. upon these things: what is good, what is lovely, what is acceptable. <clears throat> if you don't purposely practice thinking on these things, trust me, your default mind gonna think about everything else. I mean, you think about stuff that you that you be amazed. You say that you think you say I can't believe I'm even thinking that. Yeah, yeah. sometimes it be stuff. You <laughs> and don't let you be in a situation where you thinking and have a chance to let it slip out your mouth. You know. It, it, and and this is the key to it. That's where repentance come in. God's still loving and gracious, and He know that you gonna that that'll happen to you. So all you do is repent and keep going forward. You don't you don't linger on it. You just say, you know what? Obviously, God is showing me that I am. I tell this God, I am not as far along as I want to be, but I know I'm right where God wants me to be, and I'm going to accept His forgiveness and move forward. I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm not going to beat you guys up. I'm going to accept it and ask God to continue to work on me, that I can know. I want some manifestations of the work. There's nothing wrong with asking God. God, show me that you're working on me. You know, sometimes I just need to know that you're working on me. Not by some somebody giving me something, but I need to know it by some kind of thought process I have. You know, do I pray for you guys enough? Do I pray for my family enough? 
Do we do we come together and really worship God the way you want them to? Think about it. on our best day of worship, whatever that is in walking truth in any church around the world, it's still tainted. Mm -hmm. Eartha just said it, and I'm glad she said that. Yes. We sit here in church, we have a great high time in church, and your mind goes somewhere else. And so that, hold up, remember, we all one body. So once it's tainted, it's tainted. Now you may not know that because you don't know what that person thinking. So then why not understand that even when we worship God, we fall short. Right. And then he gives us grace and mercy. That we're not perfect in worship. You know, what we do is do the best that we can with the knowledge that we have and try to keep our minds focused on God while we're in here. But now, let me tell you, it don't always, it's not always that easy. My mind done drifted and you next thing you know, you at home cooking chitlins or something. <laughs> You know, you run it through the list of things. And it ain't sinful, but your mind's not on God. All the way to sinful things. There's some things that you be thinking about while you're in church. And, and let me tell you what you could think about the church. As we go on through what we shouldn't do, you'll start thinking about that, that, that person that does it and say, see, see, you shouldn't be doing that. See, the Bible said, so now you're being a Pharisee. You start thinking about when, I, when I'm teaching that, see, see. No, no, no. Back up. That's for you. It ain't for them. You here, not them. So work on you first before you before you try to remove that little thing from them. Work on yourself first. But see, you gain this through sanctification and understanding over time. When the key word in all these is when, when you begin to grow, you will begin to understand death, burial, resurrection. You will begin to understand Romans. Chapter 1, 2 of Romans 6. We're heading to Romans, the final thing of 10 and 9 of confess with your mouth. Okay? We're heading that way. Man couldn't have a relationship with God. Man is justified by faith in God and what Jesus did on the cross. And now, now we are being sanctified. We're on the other side of, of salvation. Heading towards living a life in holiness called sanctification. Okay, that's where we're headed. We're headed to Romans 10 and 9. And by the time we get to 10 and 9, it should mean more to you than it just confess with your mouth. Believe. You know, this, this, all that, that one statement, all of this has to fit into that. Okay? That statement don't stand alone. That statement, that's a, we work into that statement. So you got to believe all this back here to make that statement effective. See, and that's the difference between the simple uh, salvation that we tell people because we don't like to tell them all this. We just want to run to that. But you can't do that. You're not doing them justice if you can't explain at some level this. Okay? We want to get to 10 and 9. But you have to do in between to get them to appreciate their salvation. The biggest problem is when we read in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. How can we or as much as we love God, sometimes we neglect such a great salvation. Because it is a good salvation. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Great family Father, I just thank you. I thank you today for your word. I thank you for teaching us that we get to participate in your death, burial, and resurrection. Resurrection to the newness of life. And we have a newness of life that we can participate in. And Lord, sometimes we don't feel it, but we trust in your word that it's there. Lord, the sanctification process is done by you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way we feel it, or the way we know it, it's by the truth of your word and submission to the Holy Spirit that dwells in each and every one of us. Lord, continue to watch over us and keep us and remind us of such a great salvation that if we're not careful, we can neglect it. But thank God we're still saved. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, this is Pastor Jay. I'm excited to invite you to come over to listen to our broadcast on YouTube. Yes, Walk in True Christian Fellowship Church on YouTube. We have some great videos over there and you'll be able to listen to all the lessons and the podcast. So again, subscribe, like, and continue to comment and listen. This is Pastor Jay. Talk to you later. Peace.